It's nearly time for the May Home Assistant release already. In case you don't know, Home Assistant releases are on the first Wednesday of each month, and the first of May is a Wednesday for this month, meaning that it seems that it's come quite quickly. This video is based on the beta release, which might change a little in the coming week or so. For this month, we've got some grouping and filtering improvements, building on the functionality which was added last month, which was a great release, allowing you to categorize your automations and lots of other things as well. If you didn't watch my release video for last month, then I highly recommend that you check that one out. We've also got a really useful security improvement for this release and a few of the bits and bobs, as well as some new integrations, of course. This month, Home Assistant also announced some big changes on how the Home Assistant project is structured going forwards. In my opinion, it's a very positive move, but I'm not going to discuss it in this video. So I'll leave a link in the description to their amazing live stream all about it. Let's first talk about the additions to the data tables. In the last release, they added the ability to group entities by integration, area, and status. They have now added the ability to group by domain as well, meaning that you can view all of your entities, such as binary sensors, together in a list. Instead of just grouping entities together, it would make sense to combine this with filtering by domains, and so they've added this to the filters as well. This means that you can filter by a couple of specific domains and then show the entities grouped together by those domains. Other similar changes have been made to the automation, scripts and scene section. You can now collapse and expand sections that you have grouped by so that it's easy to find the thing that you're looking for. You can see that on the previous release it was just a list and now there is an arrow next to each group label. And the last thing that they've added in this section is the ability to bulk move automations and scripts into areas. You need to enter the selection mode in the top left, tick the entities that you want to move and then you will see a move to area drop down in the top right where you can choose the area that you want to move them to. This functionality doesn't seem to have been added to the entities table though, which would be a welcome addition for me as I have quite a few legacy entities that I still need to put into areas. The next change is a change that I'm really pleased about. There is no doubt that Home Assistant is becoming more high profile and with that means that more bad actors are going to start to likely target Home Assistant users or systems over time. This release adds a security feature called Strict Connections, which prevents any public connections being made to Home Assistant from new devices. You can choose between guard page mode and drop connection mode. The guard page mode shows the person trying to access the Home Assistant a page saying that they can't access this instance. And the drop connection just doesn't respond at all. I will definitely be using the drop connection mode as we don't really add new devices and it gives the best option for hiding your Home Assistant instance. If you use Home Assistant Cloud, then you can enable this from the user interface really easily. Go to Settings, Home Assistant Cloud, and then click Advanced Options under the Remote Control section. If you don't want to use Strict Connections, then you can just leave this mode as disabled, but otherwise select the one that you want to use. Under that section, you can see a button where you can create a login link. If you or someone else needs to access your Home Assistant instance on a new device from outside of your network, then this link will allow them to do that. If you access your Home Assistant remotely using your own setup, such as using your own SSL certificate, then you can still benefit from this functionality. You just need to set it up in your YAML config under the HTTP section where all of your SSL and proxy related config will be. Here they have called the guard page option static page instead of guard page, so I suspect that in a future release they might change this to make it more consistent. To create a login link for this setup, you need to call a service instead of being able to click a button in the UI. They've created two new services, one for using with Home Assistant Cloud and the other one for the non-cloud setup. Having these services is a clever idea because you could create an automation or a script which allows you to generate a link and then send it to someone, maybe via SMS, email or Telegram. Also, don't forget that Home Assistant already supports multi-factor authentication, so you could enable this as well if you haven't done so already. The next one is a little quality of life improvement when creating automations. You can now create helpers whilst you're in an automation without having to separately go to the helper section and then go back to your automation. You just select the entity as part of the action and it gives you the option to create the helper there. This means that you can quickly create things such as input booleans, input selects, numbers or timers. 
Now 2023 was a crazy year for tile card improvements, and so this year there hasn't been as much focus on it. But it's had an update for this release for locks. Now you can add buttons to the card whereby you can lock or unlock your door without having to go into the card itself. There's also a button to be able to actually open your door if you have that functionality. The door opener button has also added the confirmation step that was added to the last release. It's good for convenience, but personally I won't be using this because it means that you can increase the chance of accidentally unlocking your door. If they added the ability to have a confirmation step for unlocking the door, as well as opening it, meaning that you'd press the button twice, then I probably would use this feature. If you use ZHA for your Zigbee devices, then this change is a step in the right direction for troubleshooting. If you've ever looked at the network map of devices, it's confusing at best. They have now introduced some colour coding, helping you identify which devices are offline by seeing whether they're red or green entities. And also you can see which area the device is in as well. I think having a diagram is great, but if you've got 50 devices or more, then the diagram can become quite difficult to see what is going on. I personally would like to see a table mode, allowing you to sort your devices by things such as connection quality, so that you can easily see what devices might be going wrong and sort them out. As always, there are plenty of other changes and additions, and I'll leave a link to the beta release notes in the description. If you use the Glances integration to get system data, then you'll be pleased to know that they now added GPU and Network Center entities. For those of you that are interested in the technical side of the Voice Assistant, the audio is now sent via the ESP Home API rather than a separate UDP connection, which probably also explains why I previously had to loosen up some of my firewall rules to get the Voice Assistants to work correctly across VLANs. Also, if you have any integration issues, you can now enable a new debug mode. For new integrations, we have a couple of sensor-based additions, one for the ambient weather station, and another for the ARV air quality sensor. There's now an integration for the ng smart plugs, but there's no documentation so far, so I don't know how many of their devices it will cover at the moment. And then there is an interesting one for gamers, which identifies upcoming discounts and free games that are available on the Epic Games Store. A lot of these companies tend to offer some free games, but you usually have to keep an eye out for them yourself, so this could be a really great way of building up your free games collection. Three integrations have moved to setup via the UI instead of YAML this month. The folder watcher integration is probably a good one to look at, and I think it's got a lot of potential for different use cases. If you want to keep an eye on newly created or updated files, then this one might be worth taking a look at. In terms of backwards incompatible changes, there are a few to mention. The Big Ass Fans and Ecobee integrations now have had their capitalization removed from their preset modes. If you use a lot of groups, then it's worth knowing about this change because it could affect the state which is returned by the group. The states returned are now more specific. For example, if you've got a group with all your smart locks in and they're all locked, it will now return the state of locked rather than previously it would have just returned on. If you use the IMAP integration to receive emails, then check this change out as it looks like the content being returned is a bit different by default, although it does specifically say that it will only impact new entries and not existing ones. The recorder service call has now had a nice change, which prevents you from accidentally wiping out all of your history data if you don't specify entities when you make the service call. And the final one I wanted to mention is possibly the most impactful change as I feel that most people who use templates have probably used the relative time function at some point. You now need to use time since instead of relative time and there is now also a new time until function for comparisons of future times. Well, that's all I'm going to cover today. If you ever want to help out with beta release testing, then check out the Home Assistant Discord where there's a dedicated channel for the beta release. And if you want to catch up on many of the other Home Assistant changes, then check out my Home Assistant releases playlist. Please give the video a like and thanks, until next time.